right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Again, I'm Stephen Matty. I'm chair of the Standards and Ethics Committee, joined by my colleagues, Steve Levin, Karen Coswitz, Vanessa Gibson, and Margaret Chin. I'm also Ben Smith, committee to the council, and our general counsel. Um, what? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, general counsel, Jim Karras. Um, the committee is now returning to open session to make public the outcome of today's vote. Today, the Committee on Standards and Ethics found the charges against Councilmember King to have been substantiated and is recommending sanctions and corrective actions to the full Council. As you may recall, the four charges were retaliation under the Council's EEO policy, disorderly conduct, conflict of interest and in violation of Council rules and the City Charter, and harassment under the, city's, the Council's EEO policy. Under the City Charter, the Council is the judge of the qualifications and conduct of its own members and pursuant to Council rules, the Standards and Ethics Committee may find that a member has engaged in disorderly conduct and upon adoption of a report outlining its evidence may recommend sanctions to the full Council. The Committee voted today to transmit the report to Council Member King's attorneys to the full Council later today. Please note that the report will also be made publicly available by close of business tomorrow. The committee also voted today to authorize staff to make any and all appropriate refer referrals of this matter. We expect the full council to meet to consider our findings and recommended sanctions early next week. We do not take this duty lightly and this is a very serious matter. I have to start by noting that this is Councilmember King's second substantiated complaint before the committee. In 2017, Councilmember King was found to have violated the council's EEO policy and required to complete mandatory training. Less than two years later, we received the communication from the city's Department of Citywide Administrative Services that a former staffer of Councilmember King had been denied unemployment benefits by the Department of Labor and had appealed that denial by claiming that the staffer had been constructively fired due to gender-based harassment on the part of Councilmember King. It was this finding by a state agency that led to the current investi investigation. We began the subject investigation into these allegations in March of 2019. Although the committee was ultimately unable to fully investigate the gender-based harassment allegations made by the former council staffer, in part because the staffer at some point declined to participate further in the investigation. During interviews, allegation after allegation and problem after problem surfaced in the functioning of Council Member King's office. Perhaps one of the most disturbing allegations which the committee found substantiated was that in 2017, Council Member King, in an effort to obstruct the first investigation in 2017, held a staff meeting in his home where he, he identified the 2017 complainant by name and disparaged the complainant to his entire staff. This is behavior that cannot be tolerated. The evidence also clearly demonstrated that with regard to the current investigation, Councilmember King repeatedly intimidated and punished staff who he had thought or would cooperate with the committee's investigation. He demanded that staffers who had cooperated with us admit their cooperation to him. Of the three staffers who admitted they had cooperated, one was driven out of his office, he attempted to fire another, and the third must have clearly gotten the message because even a subpoena wasn't enough to compel that staffer's cooperation. In addition, he attempted to fire another staffer who had witnessed much of this conduct and who ultimately testified at our hearing. The evidence also clearly demonstrated that Councilmember King allowed his office to become unsafe and disorderly by condoning the conduct of a supervisor who repeatedly physically threatened persons in the office. It is also clear that Councilmember King facilitated numerous conflicts of interest in the office that benefit both himself and his wife. All this will be outlined in our report to the Council. The truth is, were it not for Councilmember King's behavior during the pendency of this investigation, we would probably not be discussing sanctions of the magnitude contained in our recommendations, including but not limited to a suspension, a significant monetary penalty, removal from all committee assignments, and a permanent monitor in his office for the duration of his term. Councilmember King was aware of the investigation into his conduct from the time the committee opened it on March 13, 2019. He was offered the opportunity to engage with the committee and was also advised to retain counsel to protect his interests during such engagement. However, and from the outset, the council member adamantly refused to cooperate. He refused many overtures from both the committee and the special counsel, and never once appeared for an interview with either committee investigation, investigators or the special counsel, except for one brief conversation to defend a supervisor in his office accused of threatening and intimidating behavior. During that conversation, he never once denied that any of that supervisor's behavior had occurred and in fact seemed to condone it. Indeed, instead of cooperating, Councilmember King attempted to make a mockery of this committee and the council's rules and policies. 
His attorneys are arguing that he did not have enough time to adequately respond to the charges against him. Well, the original charges were filed and sent to him on August 21st, and the hearing began on September 13th. That is over three weeks. The reason there were superseding charges filed on September 4th was that if, instead of preparing for the hearing, Councilmember King appears to have spent that period suspending or attempting to fire his staffers who were cooperating or potentially could cooperate with our investigation. While the committee certainly would have been inclined under normal circumstances to consider a reasonable adjournment, we were not going to give Councilmember King more time to hurt staffers who had done nothing more than carry out their obligations to the council to cooperate and we were not going to let him undermine this committee's and the council's authority and obligation to judge the conduct of its members. We followed the committee's disciplinary procedures and provided Councilmember King's attorneys with copies. We held a hearing in which the committee heard from witnesses and provided Councilmember King the opportunity to present his own witnesses and evidence. Councilmember King failed to appear at, the, appear at the hearing and his attorneys only appeared to object to the very fact that a hearing was taking place. They then got up and left. The witnesses were credible and damning. In general, they support each other's testimony, and there were documents that also supported many of the charges. The committee was unanimous in its determination that the four charges had been substantiated by a preponderance of the evidence. Finally, I would like to reiterate uh, that a redacted copy of the committee's full report will be made publicly available tomorrow after its transmission to the council members. This report will contain the proposed recommended sanctions as well. We are timing the public release of the report to allow members to fully review our findings and recommended sanctions. As stated earlier, we expect the full council to meet to consider our report and recommended sanctions early next week. Thank you all for your time and we're adjourning the meeting. Thank you.